I, I think this is going to be a really interesting presentation because you're going to hear perspective from somebody that really has come from real money gaming and, and has developed and created a lot of the great slot games that you guys may have played in casinos. Um, Al, Al Thomas is the um, president and co-founder of Blue Hair Studios, uh, and he's been in the business since 1993. Uh, and and saw the the evolution from traditional hand pulled mechanical slot machines um, into digital gaming, and now his company just released uh, in partnership um, with Ruby Seven Slu Studios Time Quest Slots that, that Michael Michael Carpenter's company. If any of you guys know uh, Ruby Seven, it's a great company. Um, but Al has amazing experience. A couple of the games he's done is. Remaman and no. Jackpot Part. No, no, not Remaman. Not Remaman. Did I get? Did I get that wrong? In the, well, I may do a Remaman game, but uh, Real Men. Oh, Real Men. Bad typo. That's Sorry a, about that. Freudian slip. Different genre there. Different Actually, genre. I did that game earlier in my career, okay. but I had a must, we, I had a mustache at the time that. That's I did a different that, conference. I did that game. Yes. Sorry about that, Al. Yeah, Sorry. Okay. Retraction. We'll reverse the tape there. Um, <laughs> It's, it's been a long day. But anyway, so he's going to talk to you about the transition uh, into digital gaming and some of the techniques that they're using, and uh, hopefully you guys will pay attention and learn something. Al? Thanks a bunch. Well, a as he said, I, uh, I came from the uh, three-reel mechanical, handle-pull, single-pay line world, and uh, you know, I, I was a little bit worried about giving this talk because I was asked to take, make the transition from traditional games to digital, and my company didn't have a uh, social mobile app out yet. But the, the nice thing is, as of this week, our TimeQuest uh, slots has come out. We're on App Store, Google Play, Amazon, soon to be on Facebook. So I, I kind of feel I can talk a little bit about what I've, what I've brought from that traditional casino game design world into the social mobile world. So I. Designed st slots starting 20 years ago, and I spent the last decade uh, basically doing advanced R&D for one of the large, uh, successful slot manufacturers, WMS Gaming. And in that job in advanced R&D, I was mostly working on uh, future concepts, what will be popular down the road, creating gameplay patents, doing things like uh, creating experimental prototypes that may never see the light of day. My job there was avoiding products for today. I was looking towards the future. And in order to do that, I would go to various conferences, technology conferences, things outside the casino gaming industry. And one of the first shows I attended outside of the casino gaming industry was a small show that started called Casual Connect. I went to Casual Connect because I noticed there was an amazing similarity in the demographics between casino players and casual game players there was just this overlap, and I felt that there had to be something, that there was gonna be something I could take from the casual world and bring it into the casino space. Once I came to Casual Connect and started listening to a lot of the developers, I started to realize that there was eventually gonna be a convergence between casual mobile games and casino games. So I became a regular attendee of Casual Connect. I try to get to all of them. When I first started designing casino games, I had just gotten into the industry, and I started to ask a lot of questions to figure out, well, how does this business work? It's one of the first questions I asked was, are slot games really games at all? And I had this debate with a lot of my counterparts in the industry, a lot of people who came from video game backgrounds, and since WMS started out as a pinball and arcade game company, Williams Valley Midway, I was able to go to those game designers, guys who did things like Defender and Joust, and ask them, well, what do you think about slot machines? Are these games? And they generally felt, yes, they're games. They're just really, really boring games, really repetitive games. But as I played slots myself and interviewed players, I, I started to think there's something inherently different about slots from other types of games. So I turned to the writings of uh, Chris Crawford, one of the pioneers in the game business, and he had a definition of what made a game. He basically said if you had something that was fun and interactive and entertaining, 
you had a plaything. If there were no goals involved, it was a toy. If there were goals, it was a challenge. If you had no competitor, it was a puzzle. If there was a competitor, you had a conflict. If the competitor could not interfere with you, they couldn't trip you while you're running, they couldn't shoot at you, couldn't block you, there was no interference, no attacks, it became a competition. If they could interfere with you, boom, you had a game. So that was his definition of what made a game. So taking that, I said, well, where does the slot machine lie in this? Well, it's got a goal. You're, you're trying to win money, or you're trying to get a specific combination, or you're trying to get to the bonus round. Uh, it's not a puzzle, because there is a competitor in it. The casino has to pay you. You're making a wager with them. They're your competitor. Or in some cases, um, some people consider uh, a game AI kind of a competitor. And the complex mathematical algorithms in a slot machine can kind of seem like a game, game AI. Uh, can there be interference? Well, in a fair slot machine, and especially in a real money regulated slot machine, the casino can't manipulate your randomly determined outcome. Uh, it's inherently fair. You, the, you as a player go to jail if you cheat the game. So because you can't have that interference, my conclusion was that it's a competition, not a game. And I started to design based on that idea. But there's something different with a slot machine that makes it more than just a normal competition. And what it is, is that you wager on it. It's a competition that not, not only do you participate in, but you're making a bet on it. And I know there's counterparts in the casino gaming business here, and they don't like to call wagering gambling, they like to call it gaming. Sounds better when you're getting legalization. But let's go ahead and call it gambling, and let's go ahead and call the players gamblers. So this is what we think a gambler typically looks like. But I actually think that we're all gamblers. If you take a look at the definition of gambling, the act or practice of risking the loss of something important by taking a chance. Now notice it says something important. It doesn't say money. If you take the money out, you realize that we make bets all the time. And especially as kids, we love to make bets. We love to say, I, I bet you can't do this. I bet you won't eat that. You know, it's, we love to make bets against each other. And uh, I vividly remember one of my own childhood bets. And it's a story that I just felt, to, felt compelled to tell you, uh, not only because I love it, but because it's going to embarrass my brother. So this is my, uh, my younger brother, Ben, who is also now our uh, director of games for Blue Hair Studio. Um, it's quite an accomplishment that I was able to recruit him because I once borrowed his 67 Mustang without asking and then promptly totaled it. So uh, again, I think that's probably one of my biggest accomplishments. Um, I chose this picture of Ben because I think he looks a lot more mature than his current picture. So when I was younger, I used to love Evil Knievel, and I wanted to be like him. So I took a, a slide off of an old swing set, and I made a ramp, and I bet my brother Ben that I could jump farther than he could. And because I liked Evil Knievel, I couldn't just jump for distance and take a tape measure. You know, that wasn't thrilling. I needed to do something exciting, something that would draw a crowd. Um, so I was able to convince a bunch of the uh, younger kids around the neighborhood to lie down in front of my ramp so that I could jump over them. So I lined up uh, three or four kids. I remember it as four. My brother says it was three. And I jumped over these. Let's make it five kids. We'll split the difference. And I was positive that he would not have the nerve to, try, to even try to jump. Now, there was no money involved. We were betting purely for bragging rights. Our pride was at stake. That was the thing of value. That was the important thing that we were risking as defined in 
what is gambling. So Ben gets on his bike, lines up, races down the street, pedals pumping furiously. At the last second, good judgment snaps in, and he swerves away from the ramp, and then boop, 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 runs over all their legs. So I basked in the glory of my winning wager to the wails of a bunch of little kids crying. And it was a sweet victory. It was clear to me from the get-go, people love to gamble. They love to make bets. So I don't have to figure out if they want to gamble. I have to figure out why do they want to gamble on a game where they know the odds are against them? You know, why do they continue to gamble after having losing sessions? And why do they find a game where all you do is push a button and watch real spin and stop? Why do they find that exciting? You know, I, I wanted to learn the answers to these questions, and I think over the past couple decades I have. But what got me started is I said, I'm going to do some research, and I'm going to find what's the foundational things that I need to know. What are the basic things I need to know to understand why these gamblers are behaving the way they are? So I have these four pillars of gambling behavior that even to this day, they're always in the back of my mind. They're always something that I use foundationally when I'm designing a casino game or a slot game. And I think knowing these things you know, helped me create some of my first successful games. And uh, I'm going to share them with you today. And I can hear Michael, my publisher, groaning right now for sharing any sort of secrets. But I love to talk about this. Number one is the illusion of perceived control. This is the perception that any strategic action you take during the gameplay has a causal effect on the outcome. So in the 40s, this is a psychiatrist, B.F. Skinner. What he did is he did some tests with pigeons, and he says, I'm going to give them some positive reinforcement. Um, when they peck at a bar, they're going to get some food. And they, the pigeons all learned, whatever I'm hungry, I peck at the bar. But he began to wonder, well, what if I randomly give them food for, for no reason at all? So the pigeons are going, you know, walking over here, pecking over there, doing whatever they do in their normal little pigeon lives, and randomly food would appear. So the interesting thing that would happen is that as he kept repeating this experiment, all of the pigeons started to repeat certain behaviors in the hopes that they would get the food. So he effectively created superstition for pigeons. They had this superstitious behavior. If I peck in this spot, I'm going to get food, even though there was no connection whatsoever. Humans take the illusion of perceived control even further, to the extreme where people write books on how to win on a completely random slot machine outcome. They basically come up with a strategy, apply that strategy, and they remember their wins and forget their losses. And they're like, I know how to make a slot machine pay. This is the illusion of direct control. In other cases, people say, well, whenever I wear my green shirt, I win. Whenever I rub the reels a certain way, I win. That's the illusion of secondary control. No matter which way they believe, every time they play, they start to reinforce their belief more and more. The longer they play, the deeper the illusion of perceived control. Number two is the Monte Carlo fallacy. Players believe that there's some sort of universal control system out there that balances probabilities out. You know, if you flip a coin once, you either have a 0% chance or a 100% chance it's going to come up heads. You know, flip it three times, one third, two thirds, 100%. But if you flip it, you know, 100,000 times, it's basically going to be 50-50. They believe that there's some mediating force that brings probabilities to balance. So in 1913, at a roulette, roulette game in Monte Carlo, if you know roulette, you know there's a, a bet, bet on red numbers or black numbers, roughly 50-50 payout. Black number came up 15 times in a row on a roulette table. Well, everybody thought, oh my god, this is, it's got to come up red now. People rushed to the table. They started making wagers. As it kept coming up black, more and more people joined the table. They started doubling their bet. They started tripling their bet. 
It fell on black 26 times, and players lost millions of francs. They were so convinced that the universe would have to balance it out that they fell into it. The inverse of the Monte Carlo effect is the hot streak illusion. It's saying because it's coming up black, the, the wheel is in the mood to come up black. It's, it's, it, that's the way it's going. It's the hot streak illusion. Now, there's two types of hot streaks. There's the hot game, which is the wheel is on a streak, the slot machine is on a streak, or there's the hot hand, I'm lucky. I've won so many times in a row that I'm going to continue to win. The hot streak illusion is basically reinforced by something called a clustering illusion. And it's what I said before, which is when people see a streak of numbers, they assume, well, that can't be random. I, I know the odds in my head. But real, the reality is, is that there are lots of times, if you're flipping coins, that you're going to get heads five, six times in a row. So you feel like, well, it's a 50-50 chance. There must be something that's, that's causing this streak. People reinforce their behavior. Once again, just like the other illusions, the more they play, the longer they play, they remember their wins, they forget their losses, that behavior is reinforced to them. Number four, the peanuts effect. Now this one's interesting because this really applies not only to back when I was starting in, in traditional casino games, but in the, the social mobile games of today. People are normally risk averse. You know, if I say, uh, you know, hey, do you want a $100 bill uh, or a 10% or a chance at 1,000? And you look at that 100, you're like, I can do a lot with 100. I'm going to take off with that. If I say, well, you know, do you want this dime, you know, or, uh, or do you want this dollar for a chance for $100? I'm like, well, a dollar doesn't mean anything to me. Yeah, I'll take the chance for 100. What do I care about the dollar? They feel like they're betting peanuts. It's a small amount. So that's what the peanuts effect is. And what's interesting about this effect is that it continuously changes, right? If you are just starting the game, you've got 1,000 credits, you know, you may want to bet one per line. You don't want to blow it all right away. Once you get a million credits in your game, even if it's a for fun social game, you're like, well, why not bet 20 per line? It's nothing. It's not going to dent my credit meter. As a player, the continuous play reinforces that behavior. I keep moving my bet up because the more I win, that the more that low threshold uh, rises. So, and, I, and I've experienced this myself. I can't go back to playing one per line once my, once my credit meter is a certain amount. That's what makes designing slot games very tricky because you have to take the player's evolution into account. What they liked when they first started playing your game could be very different after they've racked up some credits. And, uh, you know, there, Somebody had said an interesting story of, uh, I think it was a comedian, that, hey, I found a $20 bill in my pocket when I was washing my pants, and I was so happy, $20. And he was thinking, well, I make $40,000 a year, uh, so that's this much percentage of my salary. How much does Bill Gates make per year? What does he have to find in his pocket to be as happy as I was to find $20? And when he did the math, he was like, well, Bill Gates has to find $390,000 in his pocket to be as happy as I was finding that $20 bill. Again, the peanuts effect. If you have a lot of money, those bets can get, get higher. So there's a lot of things, a lot of techniques that people are trying. I'm very excited about all the people entering the space and the new things they're doing. But I, I believe if you really take into account these fundamental gambling behaviors, um, it'll really help connect with those players that you have that do enjoy going to casinos. And if you've heard some of the previous uh, speakers, a lot of people who play social mobile slots go to casinos. And in fact, you know, I, I have not come across a person who says, I love playing these four fun slots. I would never play one in a casino. You like slots, you like slots. So, you know, try to take these into account as you, as you develop your products. So that's pretty much it for me. I, uh, I'm happy that uh, Jessica and Casual Connects have given me the opportunity to talk about something I'm really passionate about, something that uh, I could talk about for hours. These guys know. Um, anybody has any questions at all? Or Little boy in the front. What's that now? Uh, 
So the interesting thing about virtual currency is you have an even greater uh, effect because in some cases, you get so many credits for one dollar, double down, that it's, everything's peanuts. 40,000 per line, what do I care? Uh, some, uh, some apps like, like ours, we try to have a lower bet, we try to be a little bit more realistic. Some try to stay very true to the casino, you know, but it's generally, if it's for fun, you move an order of magnitude. But you still see it. So, yes. Um, well, it goes back to the game definition, right? Where if you approach this as if it was a game, and you feel like you can take a lot of uh, liberties with the mathematics and do a lot of manipulation, assuming that the players won't catch on. Slot players are. Um, masters of pattern recognition. They see real outcomes, they're, they're spinning, and they get a feel amazingly quick that this is rigged, I, I, something's wrong. Uh, and there's some slot games that I, I played in the, in the first few spins, I had some big wins, I got some bonus rounds, and I was feeling all happy. Uh, and then my brother texts me and he says, hey, I just played this slot, and I just got a, in the bonus round, and I got big wins. And I was like, oh, well, everybody does. I'm, what do I care now? So I, if it's rigged against me now, it's probably going to be rigged against me later. So, yes. You know, I, I've thought about that, and I think um, there is an element of fantasy, right? That I could never bet 50,000 per spin in, in my real world, but I can here. But I think they had a, um, you know, they, they were an early adopter of that. And I think they, they can do it very well, very effectively. But I think other companies that try to go into, into that may not have the same, uh, same level of success. And, and remember when they started, they, had the, they hadn't had that connection with IGT, so they weren't necessarily looking at being as, as completely as authentic uh, as some of the other companies are in their math. But you, know, you never know, there is that category out there that does like that fantasy. We, we tend to try to be a little bit in between real casino and that fantasy, fantasy space. So, yes. Oh, I want one quick thing. One of the other reasons why we didn't make it so big is uh, the credit meter. I didn't want to have to have a super big credit meter and have little tiny numbers, so that's, yes. And they, they actually all balance out pretty well. I mean, some players, well, I'll, um, you know, one of the guys who works for us, even after all this talk, was saying, man, I'm overdue for hitting deuces. I, I have to hit deuces wild. I haven't hit deuces in so long. I'm way overdue for it. Uh, and then two nights ago, he went out and hit deuces. And that got reinforced. It was me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I could not resist that sensation. It, it's due. It's going to hit. I have to have it. And the more that other people said, they, oh, they've been hitting deuces, the more I feel I have to. So I guess that's it for me. Thanks a lot for listening. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk.